Welcome to StartupRad.io, your podcast and YouTube blog covering the German startup scene with news, interviews, and live events. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Joe from StartupRad.io, your startup podcast and YouTube blog from Germany. I'm right now here in my grant study uh, again during the time of Corona interviewing a startup sponsored by Invest in Hessen. Sorry if I look a little bit disarrayed um, here. Um, I've been traveling for the first time since Corona outbreak via train and I had to keep my mask all the time on my nose. That said, I would like to welcome, of course, remotely, Io Janis here with me. Hello and welcome. Hi, Jörn. How are you tonight? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. And Apologies for everybody who hears in the background. My son, he has a lot of superpowers, including to be very cute and screwing up daddy's recordings as well, of course. That said, Io Janis, you are an entrepreneur based here in Frankfurt, Rhine Main. But I've been stalking you a little bit on LinkedIn and you've not always been an entrepreneur. I've seen you had very, let me, let me get my cheat sheet called LinkedIn in here. You've been, um, an investment manager, a project lead with Dow Jones. Um, you have been head of IT. You have been in capital markets and trading systems at Market, which is a credit index company, head of indices. You have been with Deutsche Bank and then you started to be an entrepreneur. That is actually a surprising CV. How did this happen? Thanks, Jörn, for you know this intro, uh, you know this nice introduction. Um, yeah, and, and maybe I can I can put something on top of this. I'm an, actually a an mechanical engineer by my studies, so which has nothing to do with anything of the above, before mentioned activities. Oh, don't worry. A lot of people uh, who are listening to us do have a background in tech, so you're not a minority here in the podcast, even though I'm a business guy. Yeah, actually, and it's it's fun because actually I'm one of the few real engineers in, you know, in, in the um, in the engineering and tech scene, um, because many also, of course, have studied um, informatics or, or similar studies, but uh, of course there are a lot of self, um, you know, self-trained and self-educated folks as well who have got additional skills. So basically, um, yeah, when after my studies. Um, you know, it was kind of difficult to get into my actual uh, industry, uh, mechanical, engineering, automotive, or whatever. So, um, but it was quite easy to get into the information, um, in information and trading systems industries. And basically, to to cut a long story short, I gained more than twenty years of enterprise um, um, IT experience, mostly in banks. So I, I saw pretty much every angle. Uh, in banks from the front middle to the back office, smaller but also very large uh, companies and I learned basically how um, you know how to how to bring change through an organization and how to bring something into production um, basically operating a technology for a business. Um, Sorry to interrupt you here, but we do have an audience which has a heavy background in financial services, but of course not everybody would know that. So talking about trading systems, so that means you have been the guy working on the actual systems you see in the trading rooms, like the hundreds of screens and all the big machines running underneath it. That is called the front office. Then you have the guys, for example, compliance, tradings, um, and so on and so forth, the middle office. Risk management, of course, and then finally you have the guys in the back office who actually make sure, for example, that the stuff the trader in the front actually traded is actually settled in their accounts, the money goes out, and so on and so forth. For everybody who'd like to learn more about this, go down here in the show notes. We'll have some links for further readings as well. Sorry to interrupt you, but we try to make it as, as educational as possible. No, and absolutely, you're, you're spot on. Um, and, and yes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> there's even an, a very interesting story that I was working in the cash and liquidity management of a large bank during the financial, you know, the first big financial crisis where you had the names on a sheet of paper which were allowed to do, tra you, 
which the bank was allowed to do transactions, um, and uh, on another list where uh, there was no allowance to do any transaction with these banks anymore. This was a very interesting phase where we did a lot of change in that bank. Yes. Um, one question, when you're referring to the past big financial crisis, it's not 1929, right? <laughs> No, no, this was a 2007, 2008, you know, um, credit crisis, um, which which everyone, let's say, refers to as a first financial crisis, of course. Yes, absolutely. Um, interesting, may, maybe something, a, a, a small, let's say, um, adventure into the, uh, into the VC industry around 2000, 2001, after my first... Um, you know, tenure with, with Dow Jones. Um, it was the time of the new market, and um, I got an opportunity to um, change into support the first time to get to know startups from the financial and the uh, and the funding side, and um, worked um, for for a small team, and we consulted um, um, young technology and biotechnology or biomedical startups um, on on fundraising activities. Which was basically my first, um, let's say, foray into understand how, you know, how young um, startups um, are born and funded, and how how they grow or, or they don't grow. Obviously, um, the new market was um, basically, or, or the dot com bubble at that time around the two thousand two two thousand one area was, let's say, the first time where the internet. Um, became a big hype for investors and uh, stock markets. Uh, a lot of first-generation internet startups were born. Not all of them survived, but obviously remember that this was a time where I think 2000, uh, sorry, 1997, Amazon, for example, went public. This was the time of AOL and CompuServe and, of course, some other uh, names, which um, some of them are still there and some of them uh, didn't make it. Um, and obviously, there was a big, um, let's say, raise in the stock markets back then. Um, young internet startups, um, uh, you know, got a lot of valuations in their IPOs and the trading continued. But it's, at some point, you know, the market obviously collapsed. And this was also one of the, you know, huge crises. Um, but obviously, as we all know, the internet has matured since then and also the business models and uh, and uh, the companies, the global businesses doing um, yeah, um, business through the internet. It's not only commerce that has, let's say, matured since then, but it's also, if you look at today, um, you know, cloud services, um, cl uh, software as a service, infrastructure as a service, uh, platform as a service, these all, let's say, are, let's say, continuations of the things in technology that happened back then, um, I would say. I think I do get a lot of the stuff you've been talking about, especially Neuer Markt, new market was like the German uh, dot com area. And instead of NASDAQ, the, the Deutsche Börse completely shut the segment down. And that may have been one of the reasons why nobody want to get into startups so fast again after the 2008 financial crisis, because a lot of people had still been hit very hard in 2001 with a the crash there. So th that was maybe one of the reasons. That said, you have been there as well. And now the question is, how did you still decide to get into startups? Sure. So um, a couple of years um, after this, um, almost 10 years, basically, um, I worked, you know, I started to work for Deutsche Bank and um, uh, did what I did before a, a very, large um, transformation project in, um, in in the back office in the in the uh, payments and the swift messaging as they say swift is this global uh, network where all uh, money transfers are happening or most not all but most uh, money transfers between um, institutional organizations and the financial markets are, are transferred back and forth basically you know each um, each euro that is wired uh, or mo most of all most of the cents and euros that are wired from, from one place to another go, go via SWIFT. Um, and after that project, I uh, after that finished, I started to work um, in the Information Security Operations Department where I um, 
you know, managed um, a, a lot of money for for keeping the the, the human capital, the, the the experts, and the capex and the opex or investments into into our own technology and the op and and the running costs of the of the technology that we used for running the systems and. Um, Building the capabilities and funding the operations for for the information security operations of the bank, and um, this was a very, let's say, exciting environment. Very dynamic, um, very uh, agile, very adaptive. We 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 were implementing what we say a risk based approach. So. Um, um, Trying to understand as much as we could about um, the threat landscape. That uh, means threat landscape is, let's say, the, the attackers, the adversaries who are after, who are going after the customers, the employees, um, the assets, the data of uh, the customers or or the employees or um, you know the VIPs, uh, the board members, or or the executives of the bank, uh, or against. Um, the infrastructure or against the supply chain of the bank because sometimes you know when when something is secured quite well which a bank happens to be then mm -hmm. the adversaries or attackers are trying you know to get through through the weaker links in the chain which sometimes can be you know uh, uh, one of the companies that is in the supply chain as we say um i had an interview that i'll link below um, from the social in uh, from the IT seal social uh, engineering lab and those guys are also talking about the weak link and actually what do what they do is training um, the employees not to click on every link um, and I just remembered when you said weak link I remembered that they said the top management is usually the first to click on any any link they get sent. <laughs> It's it's not that it's not you know it's not always um, you, know, you you can't say it's it's a specific um, persona that is that is um, clicking on on something obviously but, but what is important to understand is that in information security you know things like uh, what you just described uh, these colleagues are doing awareness training is uh, you know sending out phishing emails and hope that somebody clicks and then trying to to catch this and and not to blackmail somebody but to educate people and make them better in avoiding these things is what we call prevention but the problem with prevention which is great and you have to do it because a, a well-trained you know employee or um, well-trained employees are one of your best let's say uh, Barriers or belong to the cyber hygiene as hygiene, as we say. However, think of that it takes only one, um, let's say, a case where, where this doesn't work, and then all your investments into prevention have failed because this is this one click that is enough to to basically derail or circumvent or uh, or for the attacker to get around your prevention. Then he's in. Whatever you have done, you could have spent millions or hundreds of millions or billions to build up walls and bigger walls and higher walls but you know it's it's just like with 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 the door if the door is locked the front door the, the burglar will will also check you know is your garden door open and if that's open or you forgot your your garden uh, you know garden windows open then he's in whatever however strong your front door was and in order you know to deal with this this is what we call the let's say um um, risk-based approach is that you try to not only invest into prevention of um, cyber attacks to be successful, but you also invest into um, what we call detection, so being better and faster in detecting that some, something has happened, and, and then also be better trained and prepared to um, react or respond, as we say, not react, react is the wrong word, really to respond, find an answer to this and minimize the damage um, and over time, um, you know, improve on on these what we say capabilities. Yeah? Um, uh, and and this is this is let's let's say um, let's say a more complete approach where something like awareness or other prevention methods are part of it. But but really the focus is on on um, getting better on also on detection and um, response and supporting. 
the business to stay, keep going with the business, minimize the impact, minimize disruptions, minimize, you know, damage, um, and um, overall uh, become faster and recovering from from these situations and um, basically more resilient against you know cyber um, cyber adversaries or cyber attackers or digital threats basically that means you're not only working on the actual software you're also working on training of the people and so actually on both important parts right uh, yeah it's it's basically um, there are a lot of things that you have to consider and um, the easiest uh, or let's say one, one of the easiest thing is to to first understand what what are the most critical assets that you need to protect and what are the risks against these assets yeah whatever that is each each organization has slightly different um, you know way of doing their business or, or a different set of assets or a different kind of threat actors that are targeting them so so this is what you need to understand first, and then um, after you've understood, understood what it is that you are protecting, then you um, look at the outside and say, who's capable of, you know, of breaking things here and getting into my network, for example, and start starting to either steal or blackmail me or, or hurt me by um, shutting things down or, or whatever their, their strategy might be or ex exfiltrating data. And the threats can not only come from the outside, they also can come from the inside. Inside, you know, attackers or insider threats are, you know, sometimes the same. You know, an attacker who is, who is capable, he might, you know, try to get a, somebody into your organization uh, pretending he or she is working for you as a contractor or permanent employee, and then they start working from inside. So it's it's quite complex situation that you will have to manage, and um, and this is basically what um, again what, what what we say is let's say this this risk data um, driven approach where we where we don't where we let's say basically have learned and understood that the um, that the adversaries the attackers are much more nimble than, than we are. They don't have any boss to ask or, or objectives to uh, to fulfill at the end of the year. Um, they have no promotion discussions, although maybe that happens in the underground as well. <laughs> but it's they, they do this professionally and 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 <clears throat> this is what, what what people don't understand is it's not always that they come in and then do a lot of damage. No, one of their biggest strategies is to come into an organization into the infrastructure and then persist as we say and and be there and install as many backdoors as they can you know directly or indirectly through their you know through the, through the supply chain and use them when they need it and for this they have built up you know really a, a fine-grained um <clears throat> let's say a business infrastructure where um really one is developing a piece of malicious code, and they assemble from many pieces of software their, let's say, attack tools. And there's infrastructure, and there's the scammers, and there's you know physical, there's whatever you can think of. And for each, let's say, attack or campaign, they they really put this together with, and it doesn't cost them a lot. It costs them maybe a few hundred euros or dollars to build an attack campaign. And the effort on the other side is, is millions sometimes in order to, to understand this kind of attack um, or campaign and build up the infrastructure and the capabilities. And capabilities always, you know, people process technology in order to, to make sense, to understand all of this, to be able um, to have the capability to detect and, and be trained to respond. Go ahead. Yeah, you have a question. Yes, I, I, I'm always smiling because... I've I've been very frequently working with very talented people from forensics, from an employee who pays my salary, as well as people from cybersecurity. And I always think when I'm talking about them, Phew, I'm glad that they are on the good side because they would make amazing criminals. Do you also have to have the same talents there? Um, there's a say. There's a saying. Um it takes a thief to catch a thief. Yeah, um, it's really what what I mentioned is attackers are devious. You know, as you may have seen in this uh, in this current health crisis, COVID, attackers even go after health institutions or hospitals. They don't they don't 
basically care that they are doing more damage to already to people who have already you know health problems for example they, they just are very devious and they have just one goal most of the times 80 or 90 percent it varies per study is just to to make financial gains yeah and you see that a lot of for example there's there's a, there was a report recently that during the covid crisis the search terms on google and other um search engines of how to hack yeah or what does it take to become a hacker really leapfrogged because uh, a lot of people who were probably not earning a lot of money went out of jobs and were looking for alternative uh, sources of income and so thought oh let's become a hacker and, and make an income as a hacker because they probably read that somebody else was uh, doing fine with this uh, kind of a job obviously um, not everyone who was searching for this will eventually become because it does probably take some skills. But the thing to notice is that many people say, don't, cannot imagine what these guys are capable of today with little effort and what they are actually really doing. They, they, you know, if they can attack you, they will attack you. And, um, and in most cases, you won't even notice that you have been breached and that something is in your organization persisted and just waiting, you know, with many backdoors, just waiting for, for um, real hacker groups or um, you know, individuals or organizations to be utilized for their advantage. What, what I have in mind from talking to some of the hackers, um, like uh, on the good side, I assume, um, is that there is a lot of information out there they can use to make their attacks more plausible, more believable, more like real. For example, uh, for German uh, companies, you find a lot of inside information, for example, on stuff like LinkedIn or the um, the websites you can evaluate your employers on, like in Germany, Kumu, um, like a glass door in the US or stuff like this, as well as you can just look into the private feed of Twitter, Instagram, and so on and so forth of um, the employees you're trying to target. And if there's something that looks like an animal clinic that has your animal the, 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 has an emergency, it's very likely people will click on it. So where is the best information source for you where, where you actually find a lot about companies there? So um, there's not one single source, um, and and that's what people um, what what is also you know one of the biggest challenges. It's you you know basically again from you you have to start from from your requirements from your most critical assets, which depends on your on your business that you are doing and conducting and. Even your operational pro, uh, footprint is important. Your M&A activity is important. So when you buy new companies or divest, this changes your threat profile. So basically from the definition of a threat profile um, and, and formulating the most high-level requirements that, that you can think of, you start to break them down into, into um, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, a framework that we call MITRE attack framework, which is which is an approach to structure the phases of an attack, and um, from there, so this is basically the techniques that describing the techniques, trying to standardize the description of the techniques that the attackers are doing, and then from there you start to select um, the sources internally as well as externally, which um, we call um, externally we call intelligence and internally it's it's a variety of sources that that can come from various systems and try to um, depict on which of these sources gives you the best information to fulfill your your mission to protect your infrastructure as as good as possible so bring you into into a position to have adequate cyber hygiene to have um, adequate prevention or invest or leverage the investments into prevention technology that you may have, but also uh, start to work with external information, information about threat actors, which which there, there are many, but you have to break it down, make it specific, contextualize, as we say, enrich it, so that when something is going on, you can 
have or get to such an awareness um, uh, very quickly. Um, it sounds complex, but it must not be. It's just you have to, this is what we call this risk-based or intelligence or data-driven approach, is that you that you start to process and evaluate um, the relevant information that you need to know of. And also, um, because this is not a static uh, process, you have to also consider that um, your adversaries or the attackers are advancing in their capabilities, are developing new tools, and this also affects your, your threat landscape. Um, I'll give you an example that, for example, think of DDoS, for example, which is a distributed denial of service kind of attack that was very popular a couple of years ago, which was basically you know, used by attackers to to um, bring your website down so it's not responsive by um, throwing a lot of traffic into it, okay? So basically, a couple of years ago, you would have invested into DDoS protection, which is available. Now, um, something new has come up, which is called ransomware, for example, and ransomware follows the same kind of principle, but even more devastating because it's shutting your operations down, not only your website, but it can completely shut down your operations. Um, if, if they manage to encrypt critical um, critical parts of, of of your systems, so so and the added benefit for the attacker is that they can make money out of it. With DDoS, they could only shut you down, but now they can money they they, they can make money with uh, with with the decrypt with you know you having to pay ransom for for getting a, a decryption key, hopefully, and hoping that this will work. So. So this this is an example for how the threat landscape and the methods of the attackers have evolved, which require um, also the um, the defendants to adapt their cyber security, information security program um, to be able to cope with these kind of developments on the adversary side. So um, <clears throat> so and 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 this is again this there's no single you know source of information it's it's multiple and if you cannot process this on your own you have to work and collaborate with um, you know with partners sometimes peers sometimes um, external companies like you know um, uh, like us or others and um, and and select you know and an the most let's say <clears throat> um, and, and learn how to how to select them or or direct your investments into these you know into the capabilities build up capabilities maintain capabilities that that really help you deliver against your mission is which is you know always protecting the most critical assets that you have as a as an organization i understand and um we have to tell our audience that you guys are not only one startup but actually Uh, some time ago, you actually split your startup up a little bit more, which you can explain soon. Um, but bef just before that, what was what you've been saying with this one of the drivers that actually got you to um, split the company? So basically, when we when when I was working in that bank um, uh, with my partner, we saw a need for for one of the biggest problems that we had. So in order to get situation awareness of what's going on, we um, we do investigations. And investigations is basically, think of it like a murder case, yeah? where you, you come to a scene, to the murder scene, and there's just a corpse, and you don't know anything of what has happened. Yeah? And as you know, some some of these cases are... Um, are, um, are take years to get... Um, To get clarified, and and this is this is very similar to how the cyber investigation takes place. Something is going on in your network, and you have no idea what is going on. Um, in some cases, when when there's something that you have uh, maybe seen before, you have some some you know better idea. But in many cases, it's really difficult to make sense of what is going on because you know guess what? That's the strategy of the attacker. <laughs> That's their job, basically. Yeah? And, and really, and, and this is, you know, even, you know, they, they, they use a, a strategy where they use the same tools, but slightly modify it so that your systems, 
you know, who, who are looking at fingerprints or other technical means of trying to compare. This is something that we've seen before us, that it, it, it increases your effort to understand this is part of something that I have seen before, or this is something completely new and, and you know, more dangerous or more targeted or, or, or whatever. So, so this is why, you know, on the one side, this risk-based approach um, with, with, with the use of, ex, you know, not only internal but also external information is, is one of the tools, but another is collaboration, exchange of information with others. It's, it can be internally in an organization, the other, the other teams, or it can be outside of your organization. It can be law enforcement, it can be, it can be industry peers, it can be even competitors, it can be, um, let's say, your, your, um, one of your vendors, it can be one of your service providers, it can be, let's say, in any other entity, you know, communities or, um, basically other sources of information. But the problem that we saw was that this collaboration um, with others was extremely difficult to operationalize. Yeah? It's, you know, it was happening every day, you know, manually. So via email, you call other people uh, and you discuss with them, but it wasn't really um, institutionalized. So, so we thought, what if you have a platform that allows you to consume all the relevant data that, I described um, is coming from your sources or source systems internally or or externally. Fuse them together, um, you know, give all the tools that you need to apply um, for analytics, and um, and also if you want, um, you know, collaborate with others on these cases, as we say, to help you um, do your job faster. Basically, put the pieces of the of the puzzle together faster you know identify um let's say artifacts that you information or data that you've collected that comes from from an attack and um and understand okay this is a little bit obfuscated but basically part of something that we've seen already so we know what to do next yeah if, the, if, if there's a critical situation or make a decision no this seems like something new and now we need to Actually, as you know, call these forensic guys that you that you know um, that you've worked with, who go to a machine and you know do deeper analysis and then bring you back that additional information. So, and and this really sounds like simple, but imagine that you have a, an extremely high, let's say, volume of data and extremely high volume of cases every day in a, in a, even in small or medium sized organizations where you have to make these decisions. So. So you, you need you, you we, we thought that there, there was a market for this. This was basically the trigger for founding um, Cosign, and um, we started. You know, we found investors um, to help us get started and um, hire a couple of developers to start developing this tool, this platform, which um, exists today. Um, we started around four years ago, 2016. Um, the product is now, you know, in the market. It's called Colab. Colab stands for collaboration, and is is exactly this: this, um, this, this collaborative fusion and, and, and analysis and investigation platform. And um, in the course of developing this, we obviously um, we we uh, founded or established two more teams. One was um, uh, an intelligence, co-intelligence um, uh, is, is, is the company called. Um, it's a team that does exactly what I described. They, um, they uh, produce finished intelligence, as we say, which is a, a ready-to-consume product for decision makers, um, a redacted information product um, that informs decision makers about uh, their threat landscape following uh, a very methodical and uh, differentiated process they also deliver you you know they deliver you written report like um, like you can read in a newspaper really redacted information but obviously specific to um, to um, cyber risks and this is basically a product to help you as an organization consume this and and, uh, and start to work um, you know obviously with tools like Colab but also with the co-intelligence to, to be able to understand your risks and, and reduce the risk of, um, of, of digital threats. And then uh, a third business line, which is 
let's say, security architecture and engineering and um, consulting and um, and specialized um, incident response um, capability. Um, so, and these three product lines that we built made it made up um, co-signed. Obviously, um, to come back to your question, um, you start as a startup, you develop some very technical stuff, and then you also have to uh, understand how to commercialize and market these things. As um, um, and, and this is something that you learn over time, where you test the market, where you find your product market fit, and obviously it's never as as you thought it would be. So at the end of um, basically last year, we found um, that um, we uh, we would um, that that the target markets, the target customers, of for all three entities were slightly different uh, and also had territorial differences. Um, for example, our technology. Um, was um, you know we we found that uh, for example there was a lot more demand uh, in the United States um, for it so we decided to you know with, with the other teams to basically give each of the teams the freedom to cater for their you know for their peculiar peculiarities <laughs> it's hard to pronounce this word so. So giving giving them independence while retaining the um, the motivation and obviously the the ability to work together, but also being able to go after their own you know main target um, um, prospect and customer base more independently. So uh, so we 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 founded Colab Technologies. It's now based in Maryland. We founded Co Intelligence. It's still based in Frankfurt, and CoSec also still based in Frankfurt. That, don't, don't worry, that finally leads me to um, the question because you guys may remember from, from like 35 minutes ago, this is a long interview, but I, I actually enjoy it. Um, you remember this interview is sponsored by Invest in Hessen and you now split your startup into three startups of which two are actually still based in Hessen. Um could you elaborate a little bit on why? So, for um, for why they are still in Hessen, or wh why we made this this move to uh, to the US, or why they are still in Hessen? Sure. Um, no, I mean this. Um, they <clears throat> so both teams have, let's say, local customers. Um, also, Colab has also local customers here um, in, in Germany, not necessarily in, in Hessen. But um, um, the teams come from here. We, we were able to secure our investor from, from Frankfurt and um, and also the, let's say, the infrastructure that, that we found um, here and, and the ability to, let's say, find office space and and um, and good infrastructure and good access to candidates um was was, was at the time and, and still be best here so we at some at some point there's an anecdote that we we thought we might get uh, more developers um if we uh, looked for them in berlin but that wasn't the case we were much more successful for finding people who wanted to be here in frankfurt so um and and still you know uh when I said Colab moved to to the United States, it doesn't mean that all the people move. We we still have um, we still have um, a good chunk of the team working from here. So so and they work together with their U.S. colleagues, which we always had. We always had colleagues in, in the United States. And a big um, other let's say plus is that we have been working together with HTAI, the Hessen Trade and Invest um, team, for now uh, more than two years, I think, and. Um, they are very supportive um, us uh, for us. They they help us, you know, very proactively, um, and and of course, this is one of you know one of the reasons to to be here to stay here. I see. And we usually interview on this channel startups that are uh, beyond Series A stage. Um, are you guys currently looking for uh, venture capital funding? Um, not at this time. So we um, we we. Um, we, we have, you know, had the luck that we, um, you know, have found our investor and then keep who keeps, you know, funding the companies. Um, so 
right now we're, we're not out looking for, for funding. We, we are concentrating on, on the commercialization of the product um, at this time. So um, marketing and sales and converting, you know, a pipeline or leads into additional customers. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're obviously looking for more customers. So, so, uh, <laughs> so, so, you know, uh, we, we, we're open for discussions for, you know, onboarding and supporting more customers at, at this time. And, you know, funding is something that, you know, might, might open up as a discussion later in the year or maybe next year. And for everybody who's not listening to this instantly, because we recorded it just a few days before the publication, um, they could still reach out to you. Go down here in the show notes. There's a link of your company website as well as your personal LinkedIn profile. And from the company website, you can find all the different entities as well as ask you personally. I would like to thank you very much for this very extensive interview. I really enjoyed it. Hope to see you again and best of luck for all the companies. Thank you very much. Um, uh, can only echo. Uh, it was very fun to, um, to talk to you tonight. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye. That's all, folks. Find more news, streams, events, and interviews at www.startuprad.io. Remember, sharing is caring. 